Hello and uh, welcome to CMC Markets and this quick um, Monday Monday update and a quick look at the week ahead on the 15th of May 2017. My name is Michael Hewson and I'd like to welcome to you, welcome you all to uh, another week and hopefully another week of trading opportunities before I get started. Um, let's get going with the risk warning which I'd like you all to uh, digest and um, uh, take in and um, once we get the risk warnings out of the way uh, we can uh, we can then get on with the uh, with, with the seminar itself or the the webinar itself so say so once once that's done we can get started now we've uh, certainly got a positive start to the week thus far um, driven higher by a number of factors um, what I was particularly struck by last week, I think, was the fact that U.S. markets were a little bit, how should we say, heavy. Um, certainly struggling to go to new all-time highs, whereas what we've got is um, European markets, particularly the um, the FTSE 100 and the DAX, um, hitting new record highs. Um, so a little bit of divergence there, and this is despite the fact that I would argue that we've got slightly stronger euro and a slightly stronger pound which is rather counter or has been counterintuitive in the context of recent gains that we've seen in the DAX and the FTSE they've usually been um, in conjunction with a weaker pound and a weaker euro. Um, so where do we go to from here? Well ultimately what we've seen with respect to the FTSE 100 is we are currently struggling to get much above 74.50. Um, we did break above that very briefly earlier this morning, but if we look at the peaks that we saw in March, the current move higher is a little bit, is a little looking a little bit overextended. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that we can't certainly go an awful lot higher from here on in, but what I am cautious about, and I'm cautious about this simply because US markets are also showing some signs of topping out, and generally despite what a lot of people would have you believe that European stocks are cheap. Certainly we're looking at the DAX and that's trading at record highs. You look at the CAC Caron, that's trading at the highest levels that we've seen since 2008, 2007, 2008. So you, you've got a situation here whereby you have equity markets in the US, which are starting to look a little bit toppy. You've got the FTSE 100 which is really struggling to gain a significant amount of traction much above 7,450 and you've got a DAX that continues to to go from strength to strength but it does it in a very incremental way and that does make me a little bit cautious about being overly aggressively um, long of equity markets particularly indices at these sorts of levels. What I would be looking for is essentially um, a breaking of new highs for the US, a breaking of new highs for the FTSE and a breaking of new highs for the DAX. Now obviously we've seen the DAX and the FTSE 100 do that but we they're doing it in a way that makes me a little bit suspicious as to whether or not there's a significant amount of extra momentum in this particular move. So that makes me a little bit cautious. Also I think one of the drivers of this particular rally is a rebound in metals prices as a result of that story over the weekend about China's new Silk Road investment project, $900 billion. I think what you have to do though is you have to put that particular project in the context of being a long-term project as opposed to a short-term one. We've coming off the back of a significant decline in commodity prices and that is prompting a little bit of a technical rebound in commodity prices and you're seeing that played out certainly in the context of copper prices today. Uh, we've seen them bounce off um, significantly low levels in the middle of last week and since then we've gone quite a bit higher. Iron ore prices which have also come off fairly low levels after declining about 33 percent since March. So I think you've got to look into the, you've got to look at it in the context of a little bit of a technical rebound with respect to iron ore prices and commodity prices in general. If we look at this particular chart here for iron ore Despite the fact that we've seen this positive news out of China at the weekend, iron ore prices are largely unmoved as a result of that. And a big infrastructure project, you would think, like a $900 billion 
Silk Road, a long-term investment project, you would have thought you'd have seen a significant bigger reaction in iron ore prices than the one you've just got. The other news, obviously, is that news um, from Saudi Arabian and Russian oil ministers that they're looking to extend the output cap or the output freeze um, into March 2018. Um, and that's had the desired effect in squeezing those crude oil short positions, but ultimately we're still pretty much in the range that we've been in for the past six to nine months. So for me, while we've, while we've, we've seen a significant rebound of the lows that we saw at the beginning of last week, we're still pretty much in the broad range that we've been in and are still quite a way off those highs that we saw um, earlier this year, around about $57 a barrel for Brent crude. And ultimately, I think when you get Russian oil ministers and Saudi Arabian oil ministers saying they'll do whatever it takes to stabilize the oil market, I don't hear, um, I don't think it's going to have the same effect that Mr. Uh, Mario Draghi's comments that he'd do whatever it takes to preserve the euro in quite the same light. Because ultimately, for me, I think it's going to be very problematic for Saudi Arabia or Russia to cut production to such an extent that um, US shale producers won't fill the gap that's left by those production freezes. Rig counts once again increased on Friday, now up at 885 gas and oil rigs, and that's the, that's another weekly rise, and that's been a pretty much par for the course over the course of the past three to four months. Rig counts have been rising on a weekly basis, and I think they're likely to continue to do so. So with respect to crude oil, it's once again, I think, a range trade play. Ultimately, what I'm looking for here, we've got the 200-day and the 50-day moving average here. But above that, we've also got the, the significant support level that we saw in January and, was, and, and in, in the first part of April, which is likely to act as a little bit of resistance on the move higher. So I think while we may see a little bit more upside in oil prices, ultimately I don't think it's sustainable. What I think we're getting is a little bit of a rally ahead of the OPEC meeting, which comes, which I think takes place on the 25th of May. So that's in 10 days' time. Also looking at US prices, US crude prices, um, we've got a similar sort of story here as well. We've got it running into the 50 and the 200 day moving average. It's quite significant here that the 50 day moving average has rolled over quite a bit, which would suggest to me that once again, the resistance level around about 50, just above $50 a barrel on WTI is likely to be the key level there. So we've seen some very strong gains here, I think, driven by a large amount of short covering, which took place on a break below these March lows. The market's been caught short between below this level here and now it's starting to stop itself out. So while I think we could get a little bit of a further rebound back towards around about $50.40 or $53 on Brent crude, I think ultimately we could start to drift back lower unless these OPEC and non-OPEC producers really do coalesce around some sort of agreement that will actually stick and I'm not sure that it will. So looking Looking at the oil picture, for me, I think there's a little bit of there's a little bit more upside in it, but ultimately I expect that upside to run out of steam over the course of the next couple of days and start to drift back down towards the lower end of the range. As for U.S. markets, if we look at the S&P 500, what I was struck by um, on this particular chart is the fact that we weren't able to sustain a move back above 2,400. And that for me I think is significant. I think if we're going to make further gains on the S&P then we really need to gain traction above 2,400. Thus far we haven't been able to do that and until such times as we do I'm a little bit reluctant to be um, aggressively long this particular market and ultimately while we're below 2,400 I would certainly look to um, I would be very cautious about being overly long at these sorts of levels. Ultimately, I think the play here really is 2380, 2400 until such times as we get a breakout, significant breakout of that range. It's a similar sort of story on the US 30, the Dow. It's more significant here with respect to the 21,100 level. There's a decent, there appears to be a decent barrier 
in and around that level but there's also a decent area of support around about the 20,775, 20,780 level on the daily chart on the on the downside. Again, I think this is pretty much tight range stuff. It's not going to be significant, I think, in terms of overall moves higher or lower. I think at the moment the market's a little bit unsure as to where it's where it wants to go to next. And I think some of the data that we've seen out of the US has been the wrong side of pretty abysmal. Um, certainly, I think if you look at uh, US retailers and their sales numbers and those retail sales numbers that we saw on Friday, which were, um, I think, singularly disappointing. We were expecting a rebound of around about 0.6% for April retail sales. We only we, we got barely less than half that. And at a time when February and March were also weak, there is a significant divergence between the confidence data that we're seeing out of the US and the actual hard data. Um, and that does make me a little bit suspicious, despite the fact that US payrolls continue to be trending at a fairly decent level of 200,000. The unemployment rate is at multi-year lows. The underemployment rate also fell. And yet wage growth and inflationary pressures still remain a little bit on the weak side. So you've got all of these factors You've got a weak retail sector, and let's not forget the US economy is largely driven by consumption. So I think there you've got a little bit of a weak point, and ultimately what I'm looking to see is any evidence that we could be starting to roll over a little bit. Um, markets are currently pricing in the fact that the US will raise rates in June. I think they're pricing it in pretty much as a done deal. I still think that we could see another rate rise this year, but I'm a little bit cautious as, as to call for a definite move on rates in June. While I would suggest that it's very, it's going to be very difficult for the Federal Reserve to dial back from that expectation, and we can certainly see evidence of that in this, in this probability of a hike that the market's pricing in for a hike at the June meeting, when I look at the data, I'm finding it very, very difficult to make the case for a move in June, which then presents us with a little bit of a problem, because ultimately, if you look at what the markets are pricing in and what the bond markets are pricing in, you look at that Fed fund thing there, 97.5% probability that we're going to get a rate rise in June. OK, so let's spin that round and let's look at what US yields are telling us. Now, this chart here is quite interesting. If you think that the Fed is going to raise rates several times this year, then you'd have to argue that you need to be long at the dollar, um, because ultimately um, interest rate differentials are going to favour the dollar more and more the more the Federal Reserve hikes rates. And we've seen two rate rises already in the last five months, one in December, one in March, and potentially we could get a third one in June. Let's see, let's look at what happened when the Fed raised rates in December. Yields peaked and then yields came down. The Fed raised rates here in March. Yields peaked and the yields came down. Now the markets are pricing in a move in June, but actually yields are starting to tail off. And I can't square that. That doesn't make sense to me. If the market thinks the Fed is going to raise rates in June, why aren't yields going up? And it's this divergence in terms of what the bond markets are telling me and what the Fed funds probability of a Fed rate hike is telling me that's making me a little bit suspicious about being long of dollars. And that suggests to me that ultimately we could actually see the dollar start to come off. Certainly if we look at the dollar index here, we can see there's a clearly defined trend in place. This is the Fed rate rise in December. This is the Fed rate rise in March. The dollar continues to decline. We can draw a line. This is the dollar index. We can draw a line right through the highs. So if you think the potential for the dollar to weaken is probably higher than it is to strengthen, then ultimately you really need to be short the dollar against the currencies, which would then argue that dollar yen needs to come lower, euro dollar needs to go up, and cable needs to go up. Because ultimately, I think when you actually look at the interest rate policy for those particular central banks, that's not going to change. So it's really about 
expectations of what the Federal Reserve is going to do over the course of the next nine months. Um, and that could be why I think yields are starting to roll over. While I think the market thinks there will be one rate rise this year, they don't think there's going to be another one. And really then it's just a question of timing. So let's look at dollar yen and see whether or not we've got any further upside after the gains that we saw last week. Now this chart may look a little bit busy. Don't worry too much about it. What we're particularly interested in is this bit of price action around here. Now we've seen a big rebound off the lows that we saw in April around about 108. We haven't and weren't able to get back above that 115 or 140 area, 114.80 area that I talked about last week. We had three successive peaks in and around 114.40 and then what we had here is what I would call a bearish engulfing day or a potential key reversal day. It made a slightly higher high. This candle here engulfs the body of the previous day's candle and then we've broken lower. Now, while in the short term I would expect the 113 level to hold here, let's drill this down because we're, we're rolling over on the, four, on the daily stochastic. Let's drill down on this a little bit. Around about 113 through these series of peaks here, we're probably going to have a little bit of support and we could edge back to around about the 114 area. But I think while we're below 114.40, and this probably could come back up, because it's oversold at the moment on the four hour chart, we could edge back up to around about 114, uh, 114.20. I would be I would be surprised if we break back above 114.40 and as such I think there's the potential now for us to edge lower. What we've seen here is these low these highs are getting lower. What's more important is this series of support through here is broken and we've made a new low there. So while we're below 114 I would expect for this particular downtrend to continue and for us to edge back towards 113 and then back to 112.40 over the course of the next week or so. I think that dollar yen has the potential to um, probably drift back down to around about 112.40 while we're below 114.40. So a slightly weaker dollar over the course of the next few days. I think it's going to be a similar sort of story with respect to um, sterling dollar. I'll come to platinum in a minute guys. I've just been asked about platinum. I'll cover that in a minute. You're brave trading platinum. All I can say is that tends to swing about quite a lot. With cable again you know there's, there's not really much to say here apart from the fact I still remain fairly bullish on the pound longer term against the dollar as long as we hold above 128. I would still expect, despite the fact that we got that weak data last week and the Bank of England was fairly dovish, we've got a host of data out later this week starting tomorrow with CPI, UK CPI, UK retail prices as well, um, as well as unemployment data, wages data and retail sales data. So we've got a pretty data heavy week for UK inflation expecting that to come in around about 2.3%. Though there is a chance it might come in a little little bit weaker um, than expected simply because I think um, Eurozone inflation was a little bit weaker than expected last week and generally what happens is the same drivers that drive that generally tend to drive global inflation. So, um, and the fact that we've got slightly weaker We've had slightly weaker commodity prices over the last month or so as well, so lower oil prices are likely to feed into that. Um, if we do get an upside surprise, and there is a good chance that we might get an upside, upside surprise because of the weakness of the pound, then that could well support sterling and push it up towards the highs that we saw at the end of last week. And if we do get a foothold through and above 130, then the triggering of stop losses should, should trigger a significant move back up towards 131. Now the consensus for the pound for, for, for UK inflation tomorrow is anything between 2.1 and 2.6%. So anything below 2.3 is likely to be slightly sterling bearish. Anything above 
slightly sterling positive. More importantly, core CPI, if that goes above 2%, then it's going to really increase the uh, pressure on the Bank of England to start thinking about um, pushing interest rates up. Not that it will happen, but that will, that will be the direction of travel when it comes to arguing for a slightly tighter monetary policy before the end of the year. Also, we've got um, unemployment for for the UK, and again, that is that is expected to remain at 4.7 percent. And we've also got average earnings, which is expected to come in or increase to 2.4 percent. So, um, I think the key driver this week for the pound will be the inflation data, and, um, and obviously we have retail sales on Thursday, which brings me neatly on to euro sterling. Don't worry, I haven't forgotten about the platinum. Euro sterling is trading in a very nice triangular consolidation at the moment with the top of it around about 84.90. So this is actually quite a nice potential um, potential opportunity for a short position maybe with a stop loss above 85.10, 85.20 with a move back towards here. If we do break out above this then the likelihood is we'll probably test these April highs that we saw here around about 85.30. But at the moment I still can't get overly enthusiastic about being long of euros unless it's against the dollar when we get a dip back to around about um, 109 or 109 or 108, 108, 80, 109. Um, with euro dollar again if we can maintain a foothold above 110 then we could get a significant breakout towards the top side um, at, uh, and, the, and the highs that we saw in November but certainly we're still in a little bit of a range top of that range is around about 110 bottom of the range is the 200 day moving average we've seen some really nice rebounds in the past couple of days but ultimately what, what I really want to see here is a breakthrough 110 on euro dollar and a breakthrough 130 on the pound. So um, that, that's, that's, your, that's, your, that's your weak dollar story. Okay, so let's have a quick look at platinum for uh, uh, for you. And uh, yeah, that's an interesting one. Let's have a look at this uh, resistance level through here. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, looking at this chart, I would suggest that we're running into a little bit of a resistance zone around about 9.34 on this particular chart. Here, yeah, let's add a let's add an RSI or a slow stochastic. Go to studies, slow stochastic, tell us it's three. And we've also got the moving averages as well. Let's look at the <coughs> weekly chart, see if that's given us any clues. Really? So the picture for platinum is that running into a little bit of a resistance zone, likely to be a little bit of selling pressure coming in around about 934, 935. Also got a trend line coming in through here and about there. So view on platinum is running into a little bit of resistance around 935. If that holds, then we could well drift back down towards around about 910 in the short to medium term. While I'm on platinum, have a quick look at gold, getting a little bit of a bid on the back of a technical rebound and a little bit of dollar weakness. Um, we did break below this trend line support earlier this month, so I'm going to remove that see if I can redraft it. Through there. The thing with trend lines is sometimes you do have to redraw them. You'll get a little bit of a technical break and then we'll come back here. But what we certainly can see with respect to this is a little bit of dollar weakness, a little bit of uncertainty, and I think the cyber attacks over the weekend have prompted a little bit of uncertainty though when you actually look at the number of countries it's affected 150 countries and 200,000 computers 200,000 computers really I don't think is that many um, when you consider how many computers there are in the world and they do appear to be only it does appear only to be affecting unpatched Windows XP computers well 
I stopped, I stopped using Windows XP about five or six years ago, so um, as, as probably have a lot of people. So while it's likely to cause a little bit of disruption, I don't expect it to cause a significant amount of disruption and would expect gold prices to come back and retest this 1240 area in the short to medium term. So before, and while it's holding above this particular trend line here, would expect it to remain, I think, fairly well supported. I certainly don't think it's going to fall off a cliff in the short to medium term. So certainly would be looking to buy dips on gold um, as, um, as, a, as a preferred strategy rather than trying to go short of it. Um, okay, so what else have we got this? What else have we got this week? Obviously, we also have preliminary GDP numbers from Japan on on Thursday. So that could be significant in the context of expectations around um, monetary policy. That that could well um, certainly guide indications as to whether or not the bank the Bank of Japan is likely to remain um, fairly dovish. In its overall outlook, we also have flash GDP from the euro area. That's on Tuesday at around about the same time, or just after the UK CPI numbers. Also got Italian GDP. Uh, I think the likelihood there is that we're probably going to find that eurozone CPI and eurozone GDP could well actually um, disappoint expectations. I think there's a large expectation that some of the recovery that we've seen within the euro area could be the beginning of a significant rebound. There is a concern and I have a concern and I did express it last week in that China's data has been singularly, singularly, easy for me to say, singularly disappointing. And that was confirmed this morning with that very weak industrial production data um, for April. Um, came in well below expectations. Um, and while retail sales were pretty much more or less as expected, I think there is a concern that the tightening of credit policy that was instituted by the People's Bank of China over the past few, over the past few months is starting to have an effect. So the question is that I'm asking is whether or not the slowdown that we saw in the April industrial production is systematic or, or an early warning sign of a slowdown in Chinese GDP in the second quarter of this year because it certainly doesn't appear to be being borne out in the European data but the but in, in in the US data there is there is a little bit of a mixed picture so that's something that I'm particularly going to be keeping an eye on over the course of the next few days so I think really the key the key things that I'm looking out for this week is potential potential short-term top in oil prices slightly weaker US dollar if US yields continue to roll over. At the moment US 10 years around about 232 and keeping an eye on the dollar index in particular and this series of lows that we saw last week because looking at this particular candle chart here it does suggest to me that we could be uh, we could be in line for a little bit of a retest of the lows that we saw last week on the dollar index, and if that does turn out to be the case, that's likely to be um, that's likely to underpin the euro. It's likely to underpin the pound, and it's likely to act as a little bit of a, a weight on the dollar yen. Um, potential slowdown. Just been asked a question: If there is a potential slowdown, why is the Aussie dollar, crude, copper, Australia 200 gone up? Well, because they're rebounding from significantly low levels. If I look at the Aussie dollar, look at where we've come from on the Aussie dollar over the course of the past few weeks. We've come down from peaks of 77 and then 75. We've hit a trend line support or just come in below, above a trend line support for the Australian dollar um, around about 73 and a half, 74. Now we're running into a little bit of a resistance area at the moment and we have rebounded two or three days in a row. But ultimately, if you look at what commodity prices have done over the past week or so, and in particular the commodities, the, 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 the CRB index, that's rebounded as well. So they've rebounded from significantly oversold areas. So there has been a slow, there, there does appear to be a slowdown. Iron ore prices are off 30% in the past few months. 
what we're seeing, I think, is a technical rebound in Aussie crude prices, copper prices, and the Australia 200. So hopefully that does make some degree of sense to you. Certainly that's the way I'm reading it in the context of why we've seen the technical rebounds or the rebounds that we've seen over the past couple of days. If you look at the Australian index here, this is a daily chart, we've rebounded off support of 5,800. So again, it's a technical rebound. If we look at copper prices, it's a similar sort of story. A little bit of a technical rebound from very, very low levels in the, in, in the context of the last few weeks and the last few months. So hopefully that explains why we've seen a bit of a rebound there. Does anyone have any other questions on um, anything that um, I've talked about? Yes? No? Okay, so in the absence of any further questions about any of the other markets, I'd like to thank you all for your attendance today and um, I'll see you all same time, same place, next week. Thanks, uh, thanks very much for listening, and I'll uh, talk to you all again. And um, good luck trading this week.